we want to make sure, and that's part of the reason, again, spread and yield is so important because we know what our investors are thinking. They're like, man, do I want to get in development now where the rates are so high and no one knows what's happening with the market? So instead of being those guys that want to, you know, advertise higher IRR, you know, great upside potential. Now we need to be, you know, what are the risk mitigants and what worst case scenario, right? So that's a little bit different about the game that we're playing nowadays. You're listening to Ice Cream with Investors, a podcast that is dedicated to teaching you how to better invest your money so that you can live a more intentional life. I'm your host, Matt Four, and it is my goal to teach and empower you to remove the roadblocks to your financial success. Welcome back to Ice Cream with Investors. I'm your host, Matt Four, and on today's show, we have Andy McMullen with Legacy Acquisition. Andy's been involved in real estate for over 20 years, and I was super excited to have Andy on the show to not only talk us through some of his background and mistakes he learned along the way, but also his newest initiative, which is developing build-to-rent models throughout the United States. As we continue to see home affordability being an issue across the United States, Build to Rent satisfies a really unique niche in the real estate space. So tune in to today's episode to learn more about Build to Rent, how it fits, and some of the markets that Andy is developing in. All right, Andy, welcome to the show. Matt, thanks for having me, man. It's an honor to be here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, we like to start with the difficult questions here. What's your favorite ice cream? I'm curious if, if you ever got chocolate malted crunch. I have not. What Whoa. is that deliciousness? It is so good. I, I remember going to Thrifty as a kid. That's how old I am. Thrifty as a kid, like 15, 25 cents or whatever. I just scoop those suckers up. My dad, when he was a kid, worked at Thrifty. So he'd let me scoop it up, man. Oh. Is it? Is it like, what? what is Thrifty? Is it an ice cream store? Is it? Oh, a- yeah, yeah. It's, it's now Rite Aid. I think Rite Aid bottom. Ah, um, gotcha. But I, I think they still have the chocolate multi crunch. I'm, you know, I'm curious if you ever had anybody say, no, you know, I just don't like ice cream. I did. We ended the interview immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Said wrong it's podcast. Like, it's like I was talking to my daughter today and she telling me she doesn't like bluey. And I said, like, that's like saying you don't like ice cream or apple pie or Taylor Swift, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, just lie well, to tell, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell our listeners, what's the scoop? What do you do today? Yeah, so you know what we've been really focused on uh, now, man, is working on built to rent. So we've been developing a lot of um, single family projects in large 100 to 300 unit range, and then managing them as horizontal multifamily. So basically, you know, my background has been in development and multifamily, and it just makes so much sense with the economy now, with interest rates, with the lack of supply, with just the kind of um, the, the Wall Street desire for, you know, yield, that this just kind of came together. And so we have a couple of partners in the Southeast and we've, uh, we're now working on our third, fourth project. So um, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. I think that's probably the, the thing I'm most passionate about helping investors consider um, today, because it's tough to find some of those other deals that we've been doing over the last couple of years. Yeah. And I'm super excited to talk about build to rent because you're the first person I've had on the show to talk about it. And it is a phenomenal trend right now going through the marketplace. But before we get there, you've actually been in real estate for a very long time. Can you take us back to where your real estate journey began? Yeah, very long time, man. I mean, I I, I started off in the brokerage in uh, working in LA, um, Marina Del Rey's little office, kind of a boutique firm that did a lot of investing um, so investing in, op- in, in industrial projects and office buildings, and then I would handle a lot of the brokerage stuff. And then we kind of evolved into other type of deals. Then I kind of got into development. So I tell people that, you know, if you stay in long enough, even a dummy like me can kind of just, you know, you can just kind of, you know, magoo your way through. And I remember sitting in the car, you know, like my second or third year, and I've been doing like, you know, other referee jobs. And I was like delivering like auto traders. And I was like, I'd come out after work and I'd be doing, you know, um, like telemarketing calls for like, you know, the Disney concert hall. And I just was just whatever it took because of brokerage, it's like, there's nothing, right? There's no, after the draw comes off the year, it's just you. And for my case, my hoopty car and whatever my resources could be, right? And that's a lot what I tell people that work with me on our team or work with us is that, you know, for those first three to five years, it sucks, right? You, you, you Maybe you collect a little bit of fees, 
But until you can kind of turn deals into more deals and, and just kind of build without paying the taxes, then, you know, it takes a while. And I always, I always hear people say real estate's way more fun than I thought, but also way harder than I thought. And I think yeah. that's part of it because there is this kind of slow climb, you know? Yeah, I appreciate the humility you came around uh, saying that even a guy like you, but I've done some research. You, you're an econ grad from UCLA. You're no schmuck over yeah. there. Yeah, I don't, they, don't, they don't give those degrees the, the same way. I don't think I would have got in this today. <laughs> that's for sure. Same, even after same. all I know today. <laughs> same. Well, um, so I'm a say I've got a sales background and I'm always interested how folks with a greenfield sales opportunity, meaning you're not working for a big corporation where you're given a set of accounts to manage, how you found leads and kind of developed your business. Could you take us back to those days and how did how did you do it yeah. back then? It's interesting. I, you know, when I hear people talk about raising money like, you know, before the Jobs Act, which is kind of what we had to do, right? Before you had these opportunities to kind of create your funnels and five or six C's and you could you could advertise. It was just straight cold calling. And people like, you know, they 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 really don't believe me when I say that because they think that just never works. And how do you stay in a business? But in order for me to find deals, in order for us to find investors, we just we had to do a lot of calling and a lot of follow-up emails too, um, and trying to set up face to face, but really the old school way. And I had I think if you were just to kind of be reductive about it. It really is about those hundred people that you really kind of invest your time into continuing, continually add value and following up, right? And, and that's what I kind of started to figure out that, you know, it's that 80-20 idea, but in, in capital raising or finding deals or real estate, there's so many, so much white noise. And you can, and for me, and most entrepreneurs that all of us that are on listening to this right now, we recognize a part of us that is like, oh, there's a shiny object. And, and with, with, you know, finding deals and, and raising capital, there's got to be a focus. Um, and for me, ultimately, building out a team so that I, they can keep me from screwing up and getting in my own way. You know? Yeah, I, I love that you said that because I think um, so many people get sucked into this. I want to be everything to everybody when in reality what you should do is go find a niche and if you can find a hundred people you can build a dang good business no matter what business you're in if you just focus on those hundred people so i'm glad that you mentioned that yeah i was thinking you know um mitch hedberg is an old comedian and and he would talk about how i, I would go down the aisle uh at the grocery store and i'd see like honey turkey and i'd see mesquite turkey and i see smoked turkey he's like why can't you just be yourself turkey like <laughs> Just, instead of focusing on all these different things, just you know, be 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 yourself. Figure out what it is that you're good at, and let the other people, especially in real estate. I know that it, it's an invest in investments. A lot of people that you've had on the show, all of these things are really team oriented businesses. And if you do try to do do it all, you you'll you'll drop all all the plates, right? You can yeah. Spend, so. Just to put a bow on this conversation, Brandon Turner, who used to host the Bigger Pockets podcast, posted on something the other day on social media that said, all real estate works in all markets. You just have to decide which niche you want to really focus on. Because if you try to do all of the real estate, then that's a sure path to failure. But all real estate works. You just have to figure out what works in your market. No doubt. No doubt. And I, and, and I think he's. it's even more apparent now where we're starting to see real estate even become more localized. Like in 2008, the music stopped for everybody, right? We were doing mm -hmm. development, the music stopped for everybody. It was just, you know, like nationally, there's nobody getting deals done really almost to like 2012. But now you're starting to see, you know, there's markets that are ascending, there's markets that are descending maybe that we thought were just favored sun. And so I think even now you've got much more opportunities to look in some of the, either your backyard or some of these kind of obscure, um, you know, markets where you can really niche down and become that expert in that particular space. Let, let me ask you about 2008. So we're entering the back half of 2022 as we're recording this. I think 2023 is going to be a very choppy year for a lot of people, specifically if you're uh, dependent on low cost of capital, which real estate uh, typically over the past 10 years has. Can you talk us through what was your experience in 2008 and kind of what did you do to navigate through that? Yeah, I, sometimes I look back and I just wonder how how we did, right? Because I mean, you basically kind of think back, we're, we're, we're finishing up a development in Venice, basically what we were working on. So 
you know, I'm, I'm lower man on the, the deal team, but we're, we're, you know, junior partners. We're trying to kind of put all the resources together. And I remember every single day from 2008, really on almost to 2011, we were just on phones with other, you know, banks like McFarland, whether you come in and take a piece or private lenders or walk in the project or, you know, is there another private investor that we can consider, you know, because this was, this was a pretty, I mean, we're talking about an incredible location and knew the asset was going to be coming back, but we had pre-sold, let's say, a, I don't know, let's just use round numbers. Let's say it's 700 a, a door. Um, now they're probably, I don't know, 1500 door, but let's just say there's 700 a door, 2008 hits, they're automatically coming down to four you know, 400 a door, right? So you're basically retrading almost your entire project. This is a live wow. workspace. So I just remember kind of the um, just overall malaise. Certainly, I, I think about, you know, me personally at that point, you know, I was probably, you would have asked me, I would have said I was a Christian, but I probably wasn't, walk, I wasn't walking that close with him. Um, and so I just, I just remember that kind of being a really, uh, you know, it was a struggle for everybody. Um, I think if there is kind of a, if there is kind of a, a, a note to take from that and what we're dealing with now is that you ultimately are as strong as your relationships, right? And so you really have an opportunity to serve people at this at this point in time because everybody needed something, right? Everybody mm -hmm. needed either, you know, a deal or a, an opportunity or money or an investor. And so I think that that would be a takeaway today. I, I do think it's going to be a choppy year. There's no doubt. Um, I do think it's a little bit different in the sense that we weren't oversupplied like we were in 2008. There is a lot of equity in a lot of people's homes. A lot of people are locked in at that kind of, you know, two and 3% uh, mortgage rate. Um, part of the reason we like the built to rent idea is because, you know, it does kind of fall into that, what we call triangle, which is kind of the high rents, you know, the low supply. And then we've got kind of the affordability gap which is just growing and growing, right? You've got now mortgage, you know, payments are about eight hundred and fifty to nine hundred dollars more than the rental payment, which kind of brings everybody to these kind of development opportunities. I know that was a terrible leap, long-winded answer, but I think I got some of it right in there. Yeah, no, I like this idea of when times are tough, your ability to serve others and to help others is what's kind of going to help you navigate through this. Um, and I think that the build to rent model, you kind of beat me to the punchline here is a very interesting model. So I want to take a step back for a second and can you help our listeners understand if, if build to rent is a new term for them, what is build to rent? And we'll take it from there. Yeah, sure. So if you think about build to rent, it's been going on forever, but let's see, let's take it back to 2008. Cause I, I do remember when we were my, my partner who's since passed on my mentor, just beautiful man, Bob Delia. um, we started going to some of these auctions, 2008, 2009, all these homes are being bought up by the Blackstones of the world. And they're basically buying them for 50% on 50 cents on the dollar. But they're in these kind of like, you know, just across counties, right? So there's no efficiencies at all. They're just trying to figure out, hey, I can buy, you know, a thousand homes in, you know, you know, 10, 12, 14 different markets you know, but then I can, and I'll just figure out how to manage them. Well, I didn't, it wasn't very efficient. Obviously those guys made a lot of money eventually as appreciation came, came up and cash flow and rents started to rise, but then they started figuring out American homes, uh, you know, black rock came back in the game. Why don't we just build these properties in one community, manage them like we would just a multifamily project. So we'll have the clubhouse we'll have the pool we'll have the you know now we'll have big backyards and that was kind of the big draw backyard and a doggy door right and now we can we can we can we can manage them like pull the part multifamily or horizontal multifamily but we don't have our managers driving from county to county to try and manage them so that's it's been going on but as far as kind of the development in the sense that now you've got wall street that needed yield Right. So if they've got their pension funds or CalPERS or CalSTRS, they can basically create that yield by the increasing rents. And then for a time they were getting, you know, some run up on the appreciation, which we might see regulate back down. But that's in a sense what it what it was and what it's kind of turned into is now 
this suburbanization has been going on really even before COVID. So you go to the secondary tertiary markets where they're like, hey, just give me a good school. Give me a good elementary school, eight or above. Give me some amenities that are that are there. Give me a community where I'm renting and I'm and not stigmatized for being the only one or two renters in the area. And give me a dog park and 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 I'm I'm loving this. And that's kind of what that's kind of what's been happening. So most of our residents happen to be kind of younger families, either couples or 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 couples with you know young kids. So that's probably about 60%. And then there's a lot of kind of empty nesters that are saying, hey, look, I, I love the idea of my barbecue in my backyard, but I don't want to do anything more than change a light bulb, right? And so they're kind of the other class of, 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 of residents that we have coming into our to our project. So that's kind of that's kind of where and you've you've seen it from, you know, anywhere from just kind of a very simple build out, like one of our projects, you know, has the parks, it has the, the you know big backyards and it has, you know, the walking trails, but no pool, no clubhouse. We'll still rent in Lafayette, Louisiana for 1700 a month, right? So there's there's a lot of demand for that kind of that type of you know asset. Yeah, I want to try to summarize kind of where I see the market and build to rent. And as a guy that's in this space all the time, I, I would love you to hear your perspective on it. In, in my opinion, there's two real trends that are going on here. One is affordability. And affordability is mainly driven by the lack of supply. So you mentioned earlier in 2008, we were oversupplied the market, all these build, it's because everybody had a second and a third home that they got cheap debt on an adjustable rate that they could just rent out themselves or or keep as a vacation home, quote unquote, ninja loans causing a lot of that. Um, so you have an affordability crisis driven mainly by supply. The second thing you see is I think this whole class, we'll call them millennials, but at the older end of the spectrum, it's the same thing where they're just by nature more transient. And that's not a bad thing. I don't mean transient a bad thing. It just means that at times in their life, they want to live in Miami. At times in their life, they want to live in New York. And at times in their life, they want to live somewhere else. And the best way to do that is to rent. However, a millennial class is also coming to the age right now where they are having two and a half kids and a dog, and they want the wet, white picket space uh, fence. They want room to work from home, work out from home, and have a family as well. So I think the build to rent model is really attacking both of those ongoing trends right now in an effective way. Yeah, and the, the other thing that I would add to it is that it, it's we're in the very early innings of it too. I mean, if you mm -hmm. think about Wall Street, the, the amount of, of real estate they own in the multifamily space is really about 50% of it, right? They really only have about 2 to 5%, depending on which, which statistic you're looking at. So when you consider that, you know, you hear a lot of people saying, well, they're just you know, bumping up the prices, but they, have, they own such a small amount of homes now. There's a lot of money being poured into the development. And certainly these next five years, we're talking about, you know, billions. But, but I think that we're still in the early stages because I think as you said, people are figuring out, hey, look, I could, I could rent something with all the new tech and I can live here for, you know, a couple of years and, and just commute to my work. I'm working, you know, from, from home, not mess with the, the traffic. Now I've got the, the barbecue and the dogs and all that. So I think it, it's starting to make sense for a lot of people, even before COVID. I think that we started to see it. I think it just basically was, was accelerated by, you know, yeah. after the yeah. pandemic. So I want to shift this now to markets. So build to rent, you're building out communities of single family homes that you ultimately keep and rent out in a portfolio. What markets are you looking at for this specific type of strategy? Earlier, you mentioned something around 300,000 people, 100,000 people, but are there specific markets you're really looking at here? Yeah, I mean, actually, so for us, it's the Southeast. Um, so really what we want to, what we want to see is can we get the land inexpensive enough? And the Southeast still has some great areas where you can get the land inexpensive enough. The impact fees are lower. You've got mayors and municipalities that are much more development friendly. The speed with which you can build these projects is crucial, as you know, in development. So we really like the Southeast. So our one of our partners is in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. We like Baldwin County, uh, Alabama, which is another really fast growing area. I think the, it's the fastest in Alabama and, 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 and you'd be amazed at what's happening there. And then we're looking at uh, like Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, the Carolinas. So we really like the Southeast. Um, I think the, the areas that we feel um, most confident is if you, if you ever, uh, if you're talking to a lender, you want to have a decent enough yield on cost. And basically what that means, I don't want to bore the audience, but just, just be, because I think it is helpful to understand when you're looking at a development project, whether it makes sense or not, 
if you're considering what that stabilized income is going to be after you've built up the project, you put all your costs, et cetera, what is that income, that net income that you're going to actually receive divided by the total cost? So let's say, just if I were to give you an example, you know, let's say that your, your, your net income is somewhere in that one, four range and your total cost for the project was in that, you know, maybe 5 million for the land and 15 million for the build, right? So that's 20 million. And so I, I think I did this example earlier. So I think it's somewhere in that 7% range, something like yep. that. And so that yield on cost, most lenders want to see maybe six and above, depending on the market. And the reason that they care about that is because they care about what the spread is. And the spread is what's the difference between the yield on cost and the cap rate, right? So if you got a cap rate that's somewhere in the five range and you got a yield on cost that's in the seven, now you can basically, you got a two, 200 basis point spread. That's a pretty good safety net, right? And why that's important to developers and investors who are in, are in development is because that basic number, what we those two numbers help us create what we call development lift, which is what's the total value that we've created by putting that amount of money into the project, the, 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 the cost of the real estate itself, the land, everything in between, and what is the, you know, against the cap, the, against the, uh, the, the cap rate. So if you just took, you know, that's what seven minus five is, that's 200 basis points, divide that by the cap rate, that's what 40%. So we've created 40% value by, you know, putting that money in and building out this income stream. And so if we can't get that six and we start seeing cap rates come up and we start letting land costs still come up, then there's not a whole lot of spread. One, you're not gonna get your loan. Two, you're gonna, you know, have you're gonna be really close to, you know, to underwater. And so we haven't been able to see those yields on costs in um, you know, anywhere else at the Southeast. So I I hope that's helpful. Um, because I hear a lot of investors, you know, we talk a lot here on cash flow. We talk a lot about IRR, but when you're looking at development projects, I think you really want to consider what is that yield. Yeah. I'm glad you explained that to me. And I actually will go back and re-listen to that because it's oh, yield shoot. on cost. That means I didn't is... nail it. I didn't nail it. Cause I, I, <laughs> no, hear, no, no. I hear you. I hear you pick up on all everybody else, whatever they say, you've got like some snappy. So I didn't nail it. That's too bad. Yeah. I just can't keep up with the UCLA economics grad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, 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 I'm, I'm saying that because like I've, I've heard this concept of yield to cost a lot here recently, and specifically in the value add space, not in the development space, but in the value add space around like, yeah, you can bump up rents and increase your NOI and all that sort of stuff. But what is it ultimately going to cost you to get it there? And yeah, I think what you're right. saying is like, if you can get a yield on cost of 7%, but an asset's trading at a five cap, you've created that extra 200 basis points of goodness or what you call right. the developer lift um which so this is impactful for me yeah, so because exactly. i've so been reading it took that two percent and then you divide it by what the, the cap rate is now you basically could tell how much value you created right so in that yep. case that's what 40 percent. so that's the big deal now if it takes you 48 months here in san diego where i'm located to try and build out a project like that and you got to deal with you know everybody in california that basically hates anybody that's trying to do something that that doesn't matter whatever your stabilized income is right because the, the time horizon is just too long yep. but that's kind of where we feel like if if we've got a relationship with the mayor and the community and they love the kind of green and what we're building there which is a little bit different than multifamily right you get your cfo after it's done right with our projects we can build one unit lease it build one unit that get the cfo the certificate certificate of occupancy and then we can you know, and then we can, you know, lease it up. So if the loan, you know, decide if it, the lending rates become crazy, you have to kind of pull in the reins a little bit, then we can, you know, just stop building, collect the income. And we're not like a half built kind of, you know, project that's in the middle of their community, right? That's super interesting and epiphany I just had in the built to rent model versus multifamily is basically what I'm hearing is like, once you finish a house, you can lease it up and start getting income streams coming in. And right. then all of a sudden that helps you balance out your cash flows because development is a very trunky or tranche. You're pulling yeah. money in a tranche fashion, which means you get a big lump sum of money and you can't 
pull the next lump sum of money until you meet certain milestones. In this case, not only are you pulling the next sum of money, but you're also getting income streams coming in. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that's part of the reason we love, we, we, we love it. And, you know, I would say, you know, with rates where they are, we had actually signed our loan. I won't, I won't name the lender, but we had actually signed our loan. I actually had the notary. And then the next day they decided to drop the LTC from where we were at 80 to 75. Basically what that means is we got to come up with another, you know, million bucks or so. I can't remember the exact number. Uh, a little bit safer deal for the investors. So it worked out okay. But if you can imagine when we started, you know, this is the, probably one of the top lenders in the, in the country. You can imagine where we started because usually those loans are set up on a spread plus SOFR, right? Which is kind of just the short-term rate. Um, I think when we started working on this project, the SOFR was like maybe 20, 30, 40 basis points. And now it's at above 300, I think. So you can yeah. imagine, you know, if you didn't have a rate cap, that was pretty significant. You could watch your projects going, you know, getting, and I think a lot of multifamily owners and a lot of people got in trouble because no one could foresee that, right? It wasn't, you know, if you got, if you got a three and a half and you just decided it was too, too expensive by a rate cap, then, you know, you probably, you probably are struggling a little bit. So what we want to do, you know, Maz, every project that we underwrite, we want to make sure that we can carry that all the way through, even at the higher interest rate, if we had to all the way through you know, for four years or five years that, that, you know, with the expectation that they didn't come down without refinancing, we want to make sure. And that's part of the reason, again, spread and yield is so important because we know what our investors are thinking. They're like, man, do I want to get into development now where the rates are so high and no one knows what's happening with the market? So we've, instead of being those guys that want to, you know, advertise higher IRR, you know, great upside potential. Now we need to be you know, what are the risk mitigants and how, what, what's the worst case scenario, right? So that's a little bit different about the game that we're playing nowadays. Yeah. And I think your build to rent strategy is a little bit different than most development projects in the sense that you already know what the established rents are in that market. I'm assuming your underwriting is based off of current market conditions, maybe minus 10 points versus like the traditional, oh, we're going to raise rents and things like that. So what I'm saying is when you're doing a traditional multifamily development, like you're not even seeing that income or um, you're dependent on what the asset value will trade at, at that given time, you're going to hold these assets and rent them out. So you're, you're kind of in a more conservative underwriting model, just in its general nature of the strategy. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, when you, when you kind of think about it, you know, there's maybe there's some cash flow deals. I haven't seen many since rates are up at the six or seven, right. Cause the, any of that, that, the Delta is not really there, but yeah, if, if we can, if we already know, so for instance, Lafayette, we already built some of them. So we know our rents are at 1700. If we can underwrite that we're not going to go above 3% per year, which I, I think is unlikely, I think we'll probably be able to beat that. Then, then there's some safety there, right? If we can, you know, have contingency that's 10 or 15% when most people have five, you know, then, then investors start to get a little bit more comfortable. If we've got a exit cap rate that's, you know, over, you know, hundred basis points or whatever that number is, so we, we try to put in these guardrails and now I'd much rather as a passive investor for me too, I'd much rather see these 15, 16, you know, IRRs with a lot of risk mitigants than I care to see those, you know, high team 20 plus in, in whatever the, the deal is, right? Um, because, you know, you, you know that there's, there's been just if you just consider the, the, the interest rates that a lot of that has been sucked out of it, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, you've mentioned Lafayette, Chattanooga. I know enough about those markets to say that both of them are very heavy rental markets. Where's Baldwin County, Alabama? What's the yeah, city? So, uh, our, our, the specific project that we're looking at is Foley, Alabama, which is kind of a, a southern part of it's the Gulf. So it, it's okay. in between Mobile. And and so um, so what I'm actually going to be going out, uh, I think we're doing next week so we can get to Lafayette. We'll, so we'll go to New Orleans. Lafayette's about two hours away. And then um, going back through that area, uh, Foley's probably another four hours from Lafayette. So they're kind of all in that range. Um, Chattanooga, we're looking at something in Austin. Austin's another, it's kind of a different animal, I think, because that market is just, I, I, I don't really have it. I think it's a moving target. Some of these markets yes. that we're working on, we kind of have a clear understanding of what's the trajectory. Um, 
so yeah, those, so that so that was, those are those are the markets that we're we're looking at now. Um, there's a the Greenville in you know South Carolina, mm -hmm. so there's a good couple spots like that. But again, I think there's I think as we talked about earlier on the pod, there's so many of these markets that make sense now because you might have one community that maybe maybe they they were just they didn't have the kind of the sewage system. Maybe they, you know maybe you're having not as much water in North Carolina. There's a lot of communities just over this last year. And now water's running through it, right? So no more septic tanks, all everything's coming in. So now, you know, infrastructure is just basically, you know, surrounding them and you could still pick up the land relatively expensive. So I think, you know, I think that if you're going to look at it, I would say, irrespective of the markets, the topography, right? We don't want to pay a lot on like land clearing, tree clearing, that kind of thing. Um, the schools, right? I think that's that, that's that's a big deal for us. If you can consider crime reduction because that's usually where people want to go um and then the you know the normal population growth you know economic growth those are all important but um i think you know the metrics for those used to be only in those kind of even secondary markets now you're starting to see them even in tertiary markets or even further out in the suburbs right yep yeah. Well, um, I started the pod by saying that you, uh, you've been in real estate for a long time. One of the things that I'm starting to ask a lot of people for is kind of their thoughts on 2023. So we've alluded to both of us think it's going to be a choppy time. I want you to kind of take off your developer hat and, uh, for a second and put on your investor hat. What should our normal accredited investors be thinking about as they kind of enter 2023 here? Yeah, I, I think that you're, you're going to have to basically be really disciplined. Um, you know, I know you've got a lot of different kinds of, you know, investors on that, that listen to your show. Um, and we've heard some great ones just on, on capital preservation, on tax strategy, on all of that. But I, but I think that what I remember about that time was patience is tough. And when you think about 2008 and then it really didn't come back till 2011 and 2012, you know, for me, that's like, well, there's 365 days in each of those years that I'm just like, hey, come on, let's let's let some have. So I think you just got to be really disciplined. And again, to me, um, it's much more important that you're betting the, the team that's got the track record and the liquidity and net worth to be able to sustain maybe what's happening because there's going to be some. There's probably been some great. Uh, opportunities over the last five years, even with younger teams that have done fantastic and very capable and talented. But I think that the second piece of that, where there's the liquidity and that worth to sustain, being able to get loans is tough, being able to refinance is tough. And I think that investors need to be a lot more realistic on that kind of lower income or lower cash flow deal with more consideration on what is their exit cap, what are they predicting, projecting for their rent increases? How much contingency do they have in the bank? And I would look a little bit more at the comps too, because I think that's where a lot of people um, are able to kind of fudge the numbers, right? You want to make sure that you're looking at the comps and are they really below what that market is? Because that you don't want to be the highest comp, right? You want to be lower. So I would look at those factors. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned comps, but I'm not going to breeze over the fact that you said liquidity. Um, I think, and I've said it a couple of times now, that over the past 10 years, we've all been a little lazy on the fact that money has been a very uh, plentiful supply and easy to grab. And I've been trying to tell a couple of my friends in my network, like, you need to have access to cash. You don't need cash in the bank because the strategy has been the past 10 years, get the cash off your balance sheet, put it in assets. It's going up so fast that you don't want to have it sitting in that balance sheet. So I'm not saying you have to have it in your personal savings account or whatever, but you need to have access to cash. And I think we're going to see a lot of people. I don't know if you're following what's going on with FTX and Binance. We are yeah. recording this the day after that happened. I mean, you want to talk about liquidity being king. Uh, the largest crypto exchange in the world just got knocked out in a matter of 72 hours because of a liquidity crunch. So and yeah, it's incredible. thank you for saying that. I was looking at, you know, like on Twitter, just days before people trying to sell for like 93 cents on the dollar, right? And imagine they, they never made that deal. Now it goes down to 50 cents. Now we're talking about, you know, zip. So yep. it, it it's, 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 yeah. So I, I, I agree. I, I was definitely on a lot of podcasts over the last year. I'm guilty of it you know, saying, hey, you got to get the equity out of your house, and put that cash in, you know, cash producing assets, right? You know, because you, you don't want that on your balance sheet, put that on the bank's balance sheet. And there's all these, you know, why, why are you sitting on that? It's just with inflation, it's going blowing up. But you're right now with, 
with where we are, you've got to have access to cash, whether that's a KP on your team, whether it's, you know, um, maybe collateralizing some of your other assets, whatever that is, you, you have no idea what's going to happen. And so you just need, you need to protect yourself. So that's, and then what we try to do is with each kind of phase for the development, we want to make sure, look, when the horizontal is done, here's what, here's where the value is. Now infrastructure, when the infrastructure is all done, now we can move on to the vertical. Where do we sit there and how with each step can we pull, you know, cash out or, 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 you know, refinance or whatever that kind of helps us secure, but we've got to be set up for, we may not ever have that opportunity. And so if you don't have the access to capital and cash to keep the property with not refinancing, and I, I think as an investor, you really got to consider whether that's the right team that you want to, you want to ride with. Yep. Well, I want to switch us now into our last round. We're calling this the five toppings. Our first one is what is your favorite book or what is a book you've read recently? That's given you a paradigm shift. Have you, have you read uh, the hard thing about hard things? No, I've heard by, about it several times, but yeah. By Ben Horst. Yeah. To me, that was a game changer for the reason, like we're running, we're all running a business and most books are written about how, you know, don't do this, don't do that. And his book was written, look, I already broke my business. Here's, here's how we fix it. Right. And because we all, we have a version of that, whether we want to, whether it's like we're solopreneurs or we've got a small team or a larger team. And, and that would really kind of change the way that I look at, you know, the evolution of growth, right? That the same people that you've got to help get to one spot might not be in the right seats for when you get to the next stage. And the same kind of uh, thoughts that you have at that stage should, should, should not be, will not get you to the place that you need to go at the next one. Right. Yeah. I, I'm going to have to put that on the reading list because that keeps getting recommended to me. So our second one is, I believe the person you become 10 years from now is directly correlated to the habits that you have and the things you do every day. What are some of the habits that you have? Yeah, I'm sure you kind of get this a lot. I'm a big um, Hal Elrod guy. I yeah. get the, the, more, the miracle morning. Um, for me, the most important part of it is the the writing. So the journaling in the morning where I can kind of just basically write all the chaff away because you, you you know how many ever thoughts we have 80 percent of them are negative right so if i can just kind of get all that stuff out of my head then i can kind of start to focus in on the things that i i really want to achieve that day usually it's three um and you know and then i then, I, then i'll read um but the journal's got to be first then i'll read and then i'll do the the workout and i do that i try to do that every day um for my affirmations it's it, it sounds like it's probably similar to yours with the bible or a book i'm reading seven right now which is a really interesting book about um the, the seven letters uh revelation from jesus is really cool to see kind of how these you know from just like a practical vantage point how did each of these churches act right and what was their culture like it was really fascinating so that that, that i think the habits and and those i tell people real estate always is so much slower than you think and then yeah. there's one day where it's just so much faster than you think, right? And so that's the, can you stay in the game long enough to hopefully get that tailwind? Yeah, I'm glad you said the journaling piece. When I first heard about that, I thought it was very fluffy and very foo-foo. And then I realized when I started doing the activity, how much negative thoughts were bearing down on my mind that I could just release and get out and start the day fresh. So uh, that was- It's the, really, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy how it's like, if it gets on the page or I use Evernote and now it's out. Now you focus on the other stuff, right? Yep. It's crazy. Yep. Our so. third one is what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, well, it's a version of kind of what I, what I told you earlier about, you know, being yourself, but I, but I do think people um, sometimes over consider an expert's view, right. Without kind of considering their own, trusting their own nuance and, and what they've learned. Um, because it's, it's like, you go to any expert, he wants to have an answer for you and, he might have just some of the facts that you do, but you kind of, you, you, you basically think that his, because he's been doing it for 20 years or 30 years, that he's got all the answers. And usually what I find is the only thing that you can really do to solve a problem is it starts from here and then it comes into focus. And you're really the only one that understands that nuance. So way early in my career, I trusted all these experts and I kept watching, kept being frustrated by why are these guys actually smart? They seem like idiots, but they didn't have the information that I did. So I try to tell my team, if there's one gift I can give you, 
is that, you know, if a dope like me can do it, then you guys can do it. So they've got all the resources that they need to, to figure out the answers to the questions. And certainly we talk about them, but um, that, that's probably the, the, the piece that, that sticks with me. I like it. I like it. Our fourth one is what's the thing you're most proud of in your life? Um, well, obviously family, but, but I, but I think one thing recently that I'm really getting a lot of, um, pride from is, is our cute Turkey, you know, is our church community. So I'm doing a lot of, um, work with the young teens and then some of the, the young kids Sunday school. So more than just kind of a Sunday, it's, you know, weekly. And so I'm really kind of starting to, to, you know, like a teacher gets so much reward from, from its students. And you always hear about people, students, me, myself, going back and talking with old teachers. So I think that part of the coaching and teaching for my life had been kind of, kind of stagnant for a little while. So I think that's what I'm getting the most pride from now. Isn't it fun to like see somebody that you see their potential, they don't, so you can kind of guide them to it. And then they finally get there. It's, it's, I, I don't know if there's a better, I mean, just the, the, the light going on and you yeah. think maybe for, you know, eight months, there's, I don't even know if they're hearing the word I'm saying. And then they'll ask a question that I talked about months ago. It's, 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 it's fantastic. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think about my life too. I was in, always in sports and, you know, the coaches that I had and the mentors that I had, you know, I don't know if they thought they were getting through, but I still have them, you know, just like God thoughts, right. I still have like golf thoughts, you know, from yeah. whatever a coach was telling me, you know? Yeah. Well, our last one is if you could sit down and eat a bowl of ice cream with anyone dead or alive, who would it be and why? Yeah, this one is, is such a tough one. I mean, obviously, you know, with my faith, of course, I would love to be sitting down with Jesus or I heard, I heard, it, but one of you guys said Paul at one point, um, you know, I, I think, I think for me, uh, I'm just really fascinated with uh, people who have kind of built their own empire from very little. So I think of like, you know, um, Stephen Schwartzman, if you, if you recognize mm -hmm. him from Black Rock or, or Mark Cuban, you know, these billionaires that are still, that, that have this money, but they're doing good with it. Like I'm always, so I would love to probably talk with one of those guys, um, I think the the idea of kind of kingdom wealth, which is kind of our why, you know, how many of these communities can we bless and how many, this this money that we've got, it doesn't belong to us, right? It belongs to him. So can we be the best steward of it? And so I, I would love to be in a situation. I think about that guy who just won, I can't remember, was it? It was in LA. Out the, I think he was a $2 billion. Yeah, $2 billion. $2 billion? Powerball. Yep, yeah, we're so, recording this so the day after I that I want to know, announced. is that guy like, what has he got planned? Is he, he can't, he can't spend 2 billion. So what kind of communities can you invest in that? that just something like that is so amazing. Maybe it was not talk to that guy. How yeah. about that's my one on one. Yeah. I, I said the same thing um, because we did an icebreaker the other day at work and somebody said, you know, everybody say what you would uh, do with the $2 billion. And I said, first and foremost, there's no way you could physically spend $2 billion. I mean, maybe you could, right? Uh, yeah. But there's no way. So you have to have some sort of passion or good that you could get back with that. So uh, it was an interesting thought exercise. Yeah, when you, when you think about like these these stories of like Bill Gates, you know, just trying to figure out how do you get water to these places and how much money does it cost? I mean, we're I try to tell my kids I've got you know twelve, eight, and five, and they're very you know my eight especially is is you know very kind of self centered now, right? I'm sure she's going to grow out of it, but when you just think about this huge world that we live in and taking that two billion and one kind of specific problem like that imagine the difference that you could you could make you know in the world so um yeah I, it's, I just love you know talking shop with you man i appreciate you having me on yeah absolutely well if our listeners wanted to reach out to you and learn more about you build to grant communities that you're building or anything else that you got going on where's the best place we could point them uh it's probably our website legacyacquisitions.com and uh we've got a lot of resources there um and uh definitely can get in touch with me on linkedin as well Perfect. We will leave those in the show notes. And then Andy, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for listening to Ice Cream with Investors. If you like what we serve you here, it would mean the world to me if you would like, subscribe, and leave a review on your favorite podcast app.